sky. I, I have to assure you, I don't walk on water. <laughs> That's the only thing I can do. But it's very um, a great privilege to be here. Um, I um, have uh, not been in Southampton, uh, I think, for something like 40 years. I came here as an undergraduate. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's very nice. Unfortunately, the weather was not uh, very cooperative. And uh, we had a very um, a difficult time seeing Winchester Cathedral even yesterday. But uh, I am uh, actually pleased at the warmth of your welcome. Uh, I must congratulate, uh, of course, uh, Professor Poppy and his team for putting this uh, whole program together. Um, let me just also say that um, I have a very broad uh, mandate here, so I uh, we may give uh, some of the topics uh, some cavalier treatment. There will be a brief period of question and answer afterwards where you could pursue, perhaps drill down if you wish, some of the uh, main themes that I'll be touching on. Uh, also, the set of slides, uh, I will uh, clean them up and put them, make them available to you uh, if you want to take a closer look. So, um, again, congratulations. I think the complex problems of sustainable development do need uh, integrated and transdisciplinary approaches. Uh, not to quibble too much, but uh, I, I, I use the word transdisciplinary because uh, multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, um, I think one should go even beyond in the sense that transdisciplinary really means that people uh, work together to develop um, synthetic models that combine uh, the features or the axioms of a number of disciplines before they apply to the problem. And this is best illustrated in an approach called integrated assessment modeling, which is used in climate change. But that is a real challenge. And uh, for those of you who are doing PhDs, I think it's a tough ask because in our day, um, we were expected to really focus and be the best uh, authorities on our narrow little subject area. Now what we're telling you is you have to do that, but you have to also do this. Otherwise, you can't solve the problems of the world. But uh, I think it can be done. And I think the uh, program here is a splendid example of the direction that academia must take. So let's talk very briefly about what the challenges are and how we need uh, integrated solutions uh, to solve them. There is a growing risk of global uh, breakdown because of these multiple shocks. There is, of course, the uh, financial crisis, which is still ongoing. Uh, has been persistent poverty for a very long time, various kinds of resource shortages, which are highlighted in this conference. Uh, environmental harm and of course climate change which we consider the ultimate risk amplifier because it simply makes all the other problems worse. Now unfortunately while the problems are synergistic in the worst possible way, um, the solutions are not forthcoming basically because stakeholders have different interests and there is a distinct lack of political will and I will mention this again later on that um, the world's leaders have been very remiss uh, and um, what we need is really much more action from academia, uh, civil society and business to push them to do the right kind of thing. So if you look at the problem of poverty, most of the people are focused in the de developing world, but there are increasing numbers of poor people, even in affluent societies. There is a grossly unfair consumption pattern, the champagne glassware, which basically says that uh, the richest 20 percentile, it's 1.4 billion people, consume more than 80 percent of the planet's uh, resources. But we are already exceeding the uh, planetary capacity in terms of ecological footprint. <laughs> Uh, so basically, we are consuming more than we can sustainably uh, expect to extract from the Earth. And of course, the climate change, the ultimate risk amplifier, 
there are two yes, uh, points which I uh, highlight for you from a report that is that thick uh, from the last assessment report. One is that the poor countries and the poor groups everywhere, even in rich countries, are the ones who will be worst impacted, which is grossly unfair in the sense that since they have the least to do with creating the problem. The second issue, of course, is more hopeful. It says that if we uh, take a more holistic type of approach, we can develop integrated solutions that will solve not only the climate problem, but also the other problems of development, like poverty, hunger, uh, ill health, and so on. So this is called bending the curve of development in a sense that we try to uh, solve multiple problems at the same time. Uh, I'll skip that one. Uh, let's talk about how we are doing today, okay, compared with that ideal uh, approach. Um, these are three levels of reality which are pictured here. The financial markets, economic growth, okay, so your GNP, stock market indices, that kind of thing, is, at, is the level that most people uh, see. And this is uh, the head in the clouds, in the sense you're always looking to make more money. But below that, there is uh, the productive economic assets, the capital, the labor, and so on, which produces that wealth. And below that, of course, are the biogeophysical resources on which everybody depends. Now, ideally, these three should be very closely linked or aligned so that then you have no gaps, you have no problems, and it's a very smoothly functioning system. But the reality is very different. Uh, this is what creates a problem. Let's take the asset bubble of 2008, where uh, particularly property values and financial instruments were grossly overvalued, and you know when that bubble collapsed, the kind of problems that, that have risen. Uh, uh, now, there is another bubble, so this is the uh, economic bubble. There is a social bubble of poverty. There are, <coughs> by various counts, between one and two billion poor people in the world, and this has been going on for a long time. There is the third bubble, which are the environmental externalities, which separate us from the natural environment climate change is only one of those. Uh, but if we look at how we deploy resources to deal with them, um, for the financial problem to bail out basically banks and companies, uh, rich companies, more than five, say six trillion dollars was found in short order by other governments of the world. If you look at poverty for the two billion poor, we spend about a hundred billion a year in terms of poverty reduction, and that's one sixtieth the amount for the bailout packages. And of course, for climate change, we put up a few billion, which is pocket change. Uh, you have other issues like world military expenditures now around two trillion dollars. So uh, I would put it to you, let you decide whether these kinds of priorities will help us to solve the problems of the world. And for now, let's look very quickly at climate change. I won't dwell on this part because uh, some of you are even more knowledgeable than I am in this area. So let's go very quickly. Greenhouse gas effect, I think you know that uh, carbon dioxide acts as a blanket which uh, elevates the temperature of the Earth above the normal level. But we need some carbon dioxide to survive, otherwise we would be a very cold planet. Uh, the main driver here is, of course, the CO2, but there are other greenhouse gases. The safe level was around 275 parts per million by volume, which was the pre-industrial level. But since the Industrial Revolution, the uh, emissions and the concentrations in the atmosphere have spiked very sharply. That's what's causing the problem. Uh, the mean temperature has risen very steadily. Uh, the sea level has gone up. Uh, ice is melting. There are also other physical and biological changes, plants, animals, and so on, which we have observed. <clears throat> and based on this, predicting what can happen in 2100, we see that, uh, as usual, will give us carbon dioxide concentrations now maybe three times the pre-industrial level, the safe level. Uh, it, temperatures of three to four degrees 
uh, sea level rise at least half a meter, probably now one meter if uh, nothing is done. Okay? It's a very serious uh, issue. And if you look at impacts, here you see that at different temperature increases, you have uh, various degrees of severity for five uh, impact areas, cold water ecosystems, extreme weather events, irreversible changes. And basically what it says is around two degrees, everything starts turning uh, a bit red. So two degrees Celsius was deemed to be uh, the dangerous level by scientists and uh, by popular consensus. But we will see later that we have totally ignored that in the way we uh, address climate change issue. And just to mention very quickly that um, there are of course large scale events which can happen beyond 2100. Uh, just for example, melting of the Antarctic ice sheets of Greenland can give us sea level rise of six to eight meters. But we are not predicting that firmly now. It's something that could happen in the next 100 or 200 years, something to be really concerned about. Now, uh, just to look at now some of the potential solutions, and here the uh, transdisciplinarity is very important, you will see at the bottom here that it is basically the past development that has caused the greenhouse gas emissions, which drive the climate domain through a process called radiated forces. And of course, the empire strikes back. The climate imposes in its turn stresses, temperature, sea level rise, changes in precipitation, which will affect uh, human and natural systems. And that in turn will change our development path. Now, at the moment, we are in a bad, vicious cycle. What we need to do is introduce two filters. Uh, and mitigation is the one where we squeeze down the amount of greenhouse gas emission. We're doing pretty badly on that. Uh, at the moment. Adaptation is the other one which simply says if the sea level goes up, let's build a wall, keep the sea up. Okay, that's a way of squeezing down the stresses. But both uh, are equally important uh, in addressing climate change. But of course, finally, this is the integration part. Those policies that can be integrated by making development more sustainable are the best. For example, growing forests or saving energy which will uh, help you to mitigate and adapt and also develop more sustainably at the same time. And of course there are other areas where you need to make painful trade-offs, but we will see that uh, transdisciplinary approaches offer <coughs> the best chance of solutions. Now in terms of adaptation, let me simply say that we know how to protect the most vulnerable the people the poor, the children, the elderly, uh, regions, small islands like the Maldives, uh, the Arctic, Asian megadelta, sub-Saharan Africa, and selected systems and ecosystems, everything from coral reefs uh, to low-lying coasts, uh, low-latitude agriculture. So we know which are most vulnerable, we know what to do to protect them, but unfortunately, the world's leaders are not taking the kind of initiative to do this. And again, let me stress that we are not talking about separate efforts for adaptation. We are simply saying that the development path can be adjusted, and this is the meaning of adaptation, in such a way that you can continue development and growth, particularly for the poor, because the poor must raise their incomes, but at the same time you climate proof uh, the, uh, your your economy and your society. And ecosystems are particularly vulnerable around the 2 degree Celsius area. Skip that. Um, let me on the mitigation side show you why we are not doing so well. And that is basically because um, the Copenhagen Accord in uh, about three years ago recognized 2 degrees Celsius as the danger limit. 450 parts per million by volume uh, as the corresponding concentration of greenhouse gases. Remember, 275 or 280 is the safe level. We are already above 390, so we are approaching that danger limit very fast at a gallop. 
uh, and nobody seemed to be doing anything. At the last meeting in Doha, uh, the countries of the world decided that by 2015 they would start renegotiating some kind of treaty, and that would be enforced by 2020, which means the effects will be much later. So you can see that nobody is taking any notice of these uh, the scientific predictions. Uh, and uh, what we now feel is that we have to plan for a 3 degree Celsius world, which is probably much worse than the 2 degree world, uh, which means that adaptation becomes even more important to reduce the vulnerability of the poor. So this uh, points are summarized here. The uh, good start in 1992 with the Climate Convention, which I have to draft, excellent document, Kyoto Protocol, a weak agreement in 1997, which has even not been honored, particularly by the US, which refused to uh, ratify. And post Kyoto, nothing really has happened, right? So it's rather sad because, again, particularly in terms of energy and land use, we know exactly what to do. And it is not very costly. There's no technologies and policies which can help to bring about this kind of mitigation. All of the sectors involved, again, transdisciplinarity is very important. Energy, transport, buildings, industry, agriculture, forestry, waste. They can all contribute uh, towards mitigation in all parts of the world. Uh, there's policies in terms of pricing, technology policies, international agreements. Everything can be done potentially, but nobody wants to take the first step. Um, let's skip that and just simply say that what we face, and I've done some my share of forecasting of future scenarios, is a kind of a barbarized world where you have unrestrained market forces without any ethical and moral values. We'll talk about that a little later because this is where philosophy and social sciences come very importantly into the picture. Uh, they really exacerbate all these existing problems of poverty, uh, environment, and even terrorism and climate change. And you wind up with this breakdown, a fortress world where, uh, you know, the rich will live in protected enclaves and the poor will live outside in absolute chaos and poverty. It is happening in, in some areas of the world already, okay? So it's not a very pleasant, and it is, I'm not predicting that it will happen, but it could. And in the, um, in the classic approach of uh, the insurance premium, uh, if something is, uh, can happen and if it's very bad, then you should actually have an insurance policy against it. And this is what we are advocating and I think transdisciplinary approaches are a very important part of going that way. Let me talk now very briefly about how we can move forward. Um, uh, I will describe a framework called Sustainomics, which I first presented at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, not the recent one, but 20 years ago, to make development more sustainable. Uh, before that, let me just give you my own take on the asset crisis. I think uh, that the financial sector has not learned very much. If you look at the current, uh, the, the amount of regulations that have gone in uh, and the current practices that are emerging, I think they're just going to go back into that old cycle of boom and bust. So this is not very encouraging. Uh, but the positive side here is in a sense that although the Western countries have had serious problems coming out of the crisis, the South has shown more resilience, and particularly the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the BRICS. Uh, and they are not only gross national product, but the whole human development index, which is a much broader indicator. They have also uh, improved very substantially. We'll talk about indicators a little bit. Uh, let's skip that. Uh, there is a post-2015 process going on now. This mandate is basically driven by agreements in the Rio Plus 20 conference last year. It was a disappointing conference because we laid out all the problems and acknowledged the problems, but no solutions emerged. There was simply a mandate 
uh, that member states should deliver a framework sometime in the future, and the UN Secretary General was asked to work on this, and part of this is developing on something called sustainable development goals for the planet and so on. But it's all about setting targets, not really finding practical solutions. Uh, that is what is said, that we are postponing uh, these uh, issues to the future simply because there is gridlock uh, in terms of leadership uh, at most of these summits. So uh, just to summarize as in terms of a long-term vision, we have a set of issues as I mentioned, poverty, resource conflicts and climate and all this. Uh, the human interventions uh, in terms of current the globalization and so on, you have unrestrained market forces which are very short-sighted. Uh, we have governments reacting piecemeal and after the fact and very inadequately. So this is a business as usual for future which is going to be very risky indeed. What we need to do, and uh, this is what I will suggest, is to try to make development more sustainable with very systematic policy reforms, uh, with governments actually being pushed by business and civil society to work uh, responsibly and focusing on four areas which are actually the drivers of most of the problems in the world. One are the, uh, the consumption, how we consume. Second is how we produce and the technology we use. Uh, population, of course, is an important issue and governments, right? And I will focus actually on the first two. Uh, and this transition requires this integrated approach. And my contention is that if we make this transition now, we will give our children and grandchildren a chance to really look at deep issues like basic needs, power structures, values, knowledge base, and move to a world driven more by social justice, a grassroots citizen movement, innovative leadership, new technologies, and so on. But to do that, we have to make that transition now, and I don't see that happening. I will suggest to you that it's very much uh, civil society and business who will do, have to do a lot in the face of uh, very poor uh, leadership at the top. Uh, so let's talk a bit about sustainomics and then uh, move to the end. Uh, first is that we focus on something called making development more sustainable, which is a call for action and for empowerment. Because basically, uh, since the Rutland definition in 1987, we spent a lot of time trying to define what sustainable development is. That's really a difficult task because it's a moving target that means different things to different people. So what we focus here is to make development more sustainable, which is a gradient method. As you know, it's like climbing a mountain. The, the peak may be covered with clouds, but as long as you walk uphill, eventually, hopefully, you'll, you'll get there. Uh, and that's basically what, what we are trying to do. Okay. Um, and I mean, at the individual level, there are so many things we can do, uh, eat less meat, uh, plant a tree, and use fluorescent light bulbs, when you leave the room, you switch off your lights. Uh, at the corporate level, we have sustainable consumption and production, which I'll talk about, corporate so social responsibility, all kinds of initiatives on sustainability accounting and reporting. This is also called the triple bottom line, where company the companies look not only at the profits, but also the social uh, and environmental impacts. There is the approach of shared value, which tries to say that in, while you uh, benefit your shareholders, you also try to benefit society and, and the environment. These are all concepts that are increasingly taking hold, hopefully. And at the national level, let me assure you, uh, and as, as a user of many macroeconomic models, that there is really no excuse. We can mainstream sustainability into all of the sectors of the economy, like energy, transport, um, uh, health, and so on, 
uh, there are models and methods to do this. It's just that the decision makers and the policy analysts are a bit lazy. They have been running their sectors in a traditional way, and they don't really want to bring some of these new ideas in. And this is where you come in. The transdisciplinarity is extremely important because you have to bring in some fresh ideas right, uh, into, into uh, traditional uh, sectors. Uh, let's skip that. Uh, the second important principle is the Sustainable Development Triangle, which when I presented it in 1992, there was some resistance because each group uh, were not willing to work with the other one. But uh, since then, what we have learned is that uh, not that each aspect, economic, social, and environmental, uh, to, cannot stand alone. What is important is the balance, and each community and society and country can choose what they want to, uh, uh, to emphasize, but the balance is very important and almost any topic you can think of has, if you put it in the middle, uh, has all three dimensions. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the links between the dimensions are equally important. Uh, the so-called green economy, uh, if it is too narrowly defined, sometimes tends to leave out the social the people side. And that is something that we should uh, be aware of because this term is used very much. So we now try to speak of an inclusive green economy to bring the social side. But that's just the same thing as sustainable development in my view. So it's kind of proliferation of new terms. Uh, we have uh, three types of assets, the manufacture, the capital, uh, the natural capital, which you know about, uh, and uh, social capital, which is the glue that binds uh, societies together, the human beings, uh, generally greatly uh, undervalued and neglected in many parts of the world. Uh, social capital is eroding very rapidly. And this is a very dangerous trend. This is leading to conflict and other things, we'll talk about that later. I think the job you're doing here to build uh, all three aspects through your uh, multidisciplinary approach is extremely important. Uh, let me skip this uh, and just talk about the third principle, which is something which is in our own mind. This is exactly what this week is supposed to do, uh, that we have to transcend uh, the boundaries of the mind. Uh, first of all, there is the issue of values because uh, basically greed, selfishness and violence are manifestly unsustainable as has been shown by all the crises of the recent past. We have to move more, much more towards selflessness, altruism, enlightened self-interest and so on uh, and especially build these values among young people starting with even school children. Otherwise, uh, it becomes extremely difficult. Unfortunately, we are now having an uns unsustainable uh, development triangle because we have very unethical social values like greed and selfishness. That is driving, in my view, a model of economic maldevelopment, uh, which is gross, uh, growth is based on unsustainable debt and waste. Um, and that, of course, is leading to the environmental debt of which climate change is only one. But it's basically a question where we are consuming the resources that should be left for our children and grandchildren. And of course, the less resources you have, the more the people fight over whatever is left. Um, just if you think about generational issues, uh, our grandchildren our grandparents, rather, uh, believed in, thr in thrift, right? So it's their saving and their investment which we are enjoying today in terms of uh, production. But we have discovered a better uh, set of behaviors and that is based on borrowing. So we are borrowing from the future. We are actually loading debt on our children and grandchildren in order also to have a good life. Uh, and this is a kind of unsustainable cycle we need some amount of debt, but not the excessive amounts that have caused the 2008 crash. Uh, and I was talking to a minister in China just uh, two months ago, and he told me the distressing fact that the Chinese uh, <coughs> uh, 
uh, economy has been well known for very high levels of sale, which is what has driven their growth in the past. But he says, our children, and they have the one child policy, they are known as the princelings in the sense that they are spoiled. He said they have entirely the different approach. They all want to consume more, they are all borrowing, they are just going the American way. So, uh, in a generation even you have, can have this uh, major shift in values, probably in a direction of unsustainability. And of course, the transcending uh, disciplines, I don't have to tell you, that the so the sustainable development issues, everything from social justice and equity to the biological and physical resources, require a whole range of disciplines, all the way from <coughs> philosophy and sociology to engineering, quality, and the natural sciences. And how to integrate this is really uh, the, the key to success. And of course, uh, the uh, business and civil society not just criticizing government, but working with government, helping them to find the right kinds of solutions. Uh, we need also to transcend the uh, spatial and temporal scales that we tend to be locked in. And I'll just give you a very simple concept on the panarchy, which may, many, of, many of you may know. Uh, this is uh, Buzz Holling, my old friend who developed this some time ago. If you look at, uh, <clears throat> let's say, systems, uh, the arrow shows uh, at the, uh, that they become bigger and long-lived as you go up. If you have a human being who uh, lives maybe uh, 100 years and is uh, on the scale of one or two meters, uh, they are actually supported by cells. Uh, and uh, those subsystems actually are uh, the ones that adapt from below and make change. Okay, so the smaller the system, the faster it acts, and it is pushing changes in the human being. But if you uh, look at what is coming from the top, you have society, collection of human beings. There the changes are slower and you have more conservation values, uh, continuity, and so on, social values which don't change. Both of these are necessary for the sustainability of the human being. In most systems, you can drill down and go uh, below the level of cells to DNA and so on. But this is a kind of analogy which says that there is a whole uh, panarchy uh, system which are all interlocked and having some kind of stability and sustainability. And we have to think in, the, in those terms. Uh, it's an interesting concept. Um, let me just finish that part by simply saying that uh, we have a full set of tools and models in this. Uh, there are many practical examples. I'll show you just a few case studies uh, which illustrate this point. Uh, and we have a whole range of indicators which are extremely important. Uh, there are actually hundreds of indicators, and as you know in research, the trick is to choose the right indicators. If you measure the wrong data, uh, you'll never solve your problem. So this is a very important part uh, of the research agenda. Uh, it's uh, very important to integrate across the three dimensions of uh, sustainability, and <clears throat> there is uh, a little bit of difference. See, because in the economic approach, we focus very much on the concept of optimality, which is, you know, Bernie's talking about maximizing the GNP growth rate and so on and so forth. Uh, in the case of environmental and social approaches, there is more kind of durability kind of approach, which says that we are concerned about overall system health. We're not trying to tweak the maximum out of our system all the time. Okay? We just want to continue in a, in, 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 in a good state. It's a more system, balanced systems approach. So sometimes these are in conflict. I mean, just to give you a very simple example, if you're an Olympic sprinter, uh, your objective is one objective, minimize your time for the run. So you would focus on that, you would have to drop the right breakfast, the right warm up, and you would even risk injury to do that. That is optimality. You tear muscle just 
to win the race. If you're a middle-aged walker like myself who undertakes uh, a daily walk, we're not trying to break any records. We just want to keep doing it for the next 20 years. That is keeping our pulse rate and our temperature and so on within normal limits. That's durability. So in most of our activities, we need both. But unfortunately, we are going also, uh, particularly in the case of the financial sector, to the optimality approach. And that means that we, when, when we approach the edge of a cliff, we don't take notice of that. And we can easily fall off the edge of the cliff. That's a problem with optimality where you focus only on one aspect. So let me just very quickly try to show you some of the best practice examples and case studies. Uh, start with climate because <clears throat> that's one area I'm familiar with and look at basically how you, uh, excuse me, <coughs> manage climate risk and the so-called right to develop. This is characterized in this cartoon where the North is considered to be well developed but actually not reducing its uh, carbon calories uh, and the South is trying to develop. Okay? Uh, from that perspective, the, for the poor countries, adaptation is the first priority. If they're going to face a three degree world and they have a lot of poor people, then their first priority should be how to reduce the vulnerability. Uh, as they get richer, of course, they will have to mitigate their emissions as well. But adaptation comes first. For the rich countries and on the left side, you have the, uh, the emissions per capita. You'll see that USA and so on are way in North America, extremely high on the right hand side of Asia and Africa where the emissions are pretty low. So what we try to do here is argue and in the Climate Convention and Kyoto Protocol that mitigation leadership should be shown by the uh, richer countries. It has not happened, unfortunately. But best, of course, is to integrate adaptation and mitigation into the sustainable development strategy with this kind of framework. Uh, if you plot here uh, climate risk, which is greenhouse gas emissions per capita, and here income per capita, which is development level, if you're rich, you're above the safe limit for emissions, but you also have high income. If you're poor, you have low income and low emissions, and most countries are in the middle here. Right? Now, the first requirement, this is something I presented to uh, at one of the G8 uh, summits. The first one is that the rich have to reduce their emissions. This is called decarbonization. Uh, and notice that they don't need to go backwards to do that. They can still have a very good life. They can continue to have growth, but present technologies and policies will allow us to do that with a much lower carbon budget. And of course you need a safety net, an adaptation safety net for the poorer countries, uh, the Maldives, which is going underwater uh, very quickly. Um, but what about the second part of the bargain, and that is the countries in the middle, they need to find a different path. They can't, cannot afford to go up this very profligate path of the uh, developed countries because there isn't enough carbon in the uh, carbon space. There, of course, isn't enough energy, there isn't enough water, there are not enough minerals for all 7 million people on the planet to live the lifestyle of the average American. But is this path possible? I think transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity is the way uh, that we can find the path. China is a very good example. I've been uh, working with the Chinese. They are making serious efforts to find this path. And I think uh, there's a lot of technology cooperation and support to do this. But we, we really need to find this path. Um, we need to integrate, as I said, that kind of approach at the country level. We have the models uh, to do it, uh, macroeconomic and sectoral models, environmental analysis, and so on. Uh, we have the approach of expanded green national income accounts, uh, which is basically saying uh, that uh, 
uh, man does not live by bread alone kind of approach that if we just measure material consumption, then we are not really accounting for everything. We should also look at the environmental uh, and the social impacts if we can in trying to develop an index of uh, human uh, well-being. And this is captured to some extent in the Human Development Index that is <coughs> produced by the UNDP, uh, which is broader than G GNP. But it is also captured in some of the new models that we are developing. There is an index of gross national happiness, which the UN is trying to develop together with the uh, Kingdom of Bhutan. I was invited last month by the King of Bhutan to go and help to develop this model. Uh, it's, it is respectable work, okay, although it's called gross national happiness. Uh, let me just mention very quickly one example. It involves water, climate change, and uh, agriculture in Sri Lanka. Uh, we use a methodology called action impact matrix, which is a way of linking um, impacts with policy actions. Right? So you have the process involves a participative process of stakeholders and experts uh, who work for two days, a little bit like this. It's a multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder exercise. They start by disagreeing violently on everything. For example, environmentalists and economists never agree on anything. Uh, but after two days, we have a process of discussion and facil facilitation, which allows them to uh, appreciate each other's viewpoint and also to develop joint solutions. So there is ownership here at the end of the day. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, I'll skip, uh, yeah, this is one, one example. And just to tell you, for example, here are the set of national policies that are followed in Sri Lanka. Growth, poverty, food, employment, and so on. Here are a set of impacts, uh, particularly with respect to climate. And what this simply says is uh, the, 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 the consensus of the two-day workshop we look at vulnerabilities. Here is that uh, the impact of agricultural output and water resources, the minus three means that these are very uh, bad, in bad shape, uh, being harmful, high because of climate change, that these two resource impacts will seriously threaten the objective of food security in the government. Right? So you can have other kinds of impacts here, but the point of the uh, in indices is really to get a consensus on what are the most serious problems of the day. So you have a hundred more or more cells, but you can quickly identify three or four problems that are the most important in this uh, area. And so therefore we go away and we say, look, that model tells us that water, agriculture, and food security, and climate form a nexus. Let us do a little bit of research into this. And what we do is we have a, a, a general circulation model, which is a humongous uh, climate type of exercise, but we apply it to Sri Lanka, which is a very small pixel in the global stage. But we try to predict what the uh, this is purely a climate type of model, but we predict what is going to happen in 2050. Uh, we have a separate macroeconomic model, of which agriculture is an important part, multi-sector model, where we try to project the growth of agriculture, uh, and we impose the impacts of climate on that by 2050. And then we predict, I'm sorry to be so cavalier, but you can ask me later, uh, we predict what might happen. And there are two crops which are seriously affected, rice, which is a major contributor to GDP, uh, and uh, plantation crops, particularly tea, which Sri, Sri Lanka is a major exporter. Uh, and what this tells you is there are two things here going on. One is that the agricultural production goes down, but the plantation crops actually improve because of the climatic conditions, because of the greater rainfall in the areas where uh, tea is grown. Now, what this tells you is that the overall impact on the economy, the agriculture is offset by the uh, tea production. 
There is, though, a significant risk to food security because rice is a staple crop. There is a huge poverty impact on small farmers uh, who, who are living in the dry zone, who grow the rice. And there is, of course, an equity impact because the people who grow tea are richer. They are large plantations. The people who grow rice are small farmers. They are poor. So the, again, in this very small country, small model, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer as a result of climate change. And there can be demographic impacts. So the point I'm trying to make is that very quickly, with a very minimum of effort and by looking at things on a bigger scale, you can find some very interesting policy solutions. And you can go to the Minister of Agriculture and the Ministry of Water and whatever and explain this. And if you explain this in this way, that this is what climate will do to your sector, then you get the kind of attention you need. Whereas otherwise climate change is a, is a distant blip on their radar horizon anyway, unless you bring the reality of future impacts right down, uh, I mean, show it uh, very clearly. So uh, let me just mention one other uh, thing and uh, move to the end. Uh, one is the example here that I'm going to show is something slightly different which is that you have environmental impacts and social impacts which are measured in non-economic terms. So very often they are left out of the economic calculus. Okay? You can lose species, you can have tremendous impacts on poor people, but if the economic output goes up, then people tend to say, oh, well, it's a good thing, let's forget about those impacts. So one of the things is called economic valuation of environmental impacts and what we did is we took a case study of a rainforest in Madagascar to look at a number of types of impacts. One is called direct use values because the forest produces things like timber uh, and other things which have direct market value. There are indirect values which uh, some of you I think are very familiar with forests protect the watersheds, uh, they absorb carbon from the atmosphere, they have no market value, but they are extremely important. And then you have a number of social values like existence value, in the case of Madagascar, uh, the forest had a certain spiritual value, the ancestors, uh, and so on. So that uh, these, again, are called non-use values, but they should not be neglected in the way that we try to look at how we uh, exploit or develop the forest. So this is a kind of assessment we did. Madagascar is a, is a kind of a mega uh, diversity uh, area, country, and uh, what we wanted to look at was should an uh, area that is undeveloped be uh, converted into a national park? What are the implications? So from the economic side, you try to maximize their benefits. From the social side, you have a number of stakeholders. You have villagers who live on site in that area. You have tourists, uh, foreigners who come from outside, as well as local people, Madagascans from the capital. And you have also the government, which represent everybody as the people of Madagascar. From the environment side, you need to maintain the ecosystem. So these are the kinds of things you balance. Um, we look at the three important aspects from the environment point of view, which is provisioning, regulation, and the cultural aspect, which I mentioned. We used a number of valuation techniques, which I don't really have the time uh, to go into. But let's just give you an example of, of uh, the, the economic side. This is not just only about tourists coming and spending money. If you look at the lifestyle of the villagers, and it was a very difficult to measure this, you find that they have, they produce a little rice, they have various kinds of uh, forest products, small amounts, but this is their basic livelihood. Uh, so if you add up all these together, let me show you that this is, if the poor people were displaced from the farm, they would lose their livelihoods, what I showed you, and this is the value of the of what they would lose. Now, you, if you converted the path to 
foreign tourism, this is the different measurement, three different measurements of the value of the park for tourism in terms of revenues you could collect or willingness to pay. And now you can see that converting the park to tourism from purely economic terms is more valuable than what you're depriving uh, the villages of. So uh, a crude solution would be, okay, let's change the park, let's extract the money, pay off the villages and kick them out. But that is not what we recommended. I mean, clearly there is a balance. So you create, you know, you can create a buffer zone, you can have a part of the park uh, allocated to for the, for the local and a part which is for development. But this is a kind of approach that I'm trying to say that develop the policy uh, solutions that you need in a real world situation where you have conflict between stakeholders, you have enough, again multidisciplinarity because number of disciplines are, are involved in this. So you can determine everything from the price you need to charge from the tourists all the way to the compensation you have to pay uh, to the local uh, uh, indigenous people who might be displaced and so on. Uh, the last example that I very quickly show you is a small hydro scheme and how you look not only at the economics but also the social and ecological indicators. Now when you look at small hydro which is a renewable form of energy, normally you only look at how much it costs to develop the site, that is the main criteria. But we said no, let us look at two other indicators, the social one which says how many people are displaced because when you develop a site you might flood some land in some local villages so though you have to displace those villages. And similarly, what is the loss of biodiversity because of inundation. Now, if you include those indicators and this, this is a graph of 25 different sites, each of them has the economic cost, the social cost, and here the biological cost, right? Three. Now, if you look at this like this, it's, it's really difficult to make a decision because in some cases the economic cost is high, in another case the social cost is high and so on. In fact, if you went with this diagram to see a minister, you would be shown the door very quickly because nobody could make a decision. But if you plot the same results in this three-dimensional way, this is the economic, this is the cost of developing the site per kilowatt hour. This is the number of, this is the social cost. How many people you have to resettle? And here, this is the biodiversity loss. It's measured in terms of an index. So you are not measuring the biodiversity loss in economic terms because it's difficult. You are not measuring the social cost in economic terms. It's just number of people displaced. So you have three different axes. You can't conflate them into one. But what this multi-criteria analysis tells you is that the further we go from the axis, the worse the situation is. Therefore, although we cannot value the biological and social problems, at least we know that these sites that are close to the origin are the best, the sites that are far from the origin are the worst because they are the worst in terms of all three dimensions. So again, what I'm trying to tell you is there are techniques where, where, you, where some of the disciplines cannot be easily uh, mapped onto the same thing, but you can still use uh, different types of uh, indicators and uh, make trade-offs and come to a, a right decision. So let me spend maybe five minutes more and finish up with sustainable consumption. Uh, which is an important part of the solution uh, and the idea is, uh, this is a concept that the Chinese at the highest levels of government are pushing, which is a kind of a 21st century global eco-civilization based on the sustainable development triangle. Uh, I have proposed three targets for say 2030. One is the social need, the basic needs of all human beings but also ensure peace, harmony, <laughs> social justice and security from the environmental side to reduce our global footprint to less than one planet Earth. This is very important. On the economic side, to have prosperity, 
but to respect critical environmental and social constraints. Okay? Uh, not uh, impossible to achieve. So we have to reduce our economic footprint. We have to make sure that the rich do not overconsume, which I mentioned. And we have to also raise the 2 billion poor out of poverty in the post-2015 agenda. Because right now, with business as usual, there just are not enough resources to raise the poor out of poverty. So we have to do this, and we have to do this. There are two different paths for the affluent and for the poor. Remember, the affluent live not only in Western countries. There are more billionaires in Asia than there are in America. Okay? And the affluent in the developing countries have exactly the consumption patterns of the affluent in the West. So they are also trying to go up that uh, unsustainable curve. So this is extremely important. The poor have to be raised out of poverty uh, through a more sustainable path. Their incomes have to go up. And the rich can manage to maintain a good quality of life, but maybe with less packaging and with some of the frails taken off. Right? Uh, so basically, as I said, the consumption of the rich should not crowd out the development prospects of the poor. Right? And this is where I propose this uh, something called millennium consumption goals. That is basically one says the poor are under consuming. Let us guarantee their basic needs of food, water, energy, and health. Every human being on the planet. This is not explicitly recognized in the Millennium Development Goals, which are now in existence. It is implicit, but I think we should explicitly say consumption of the poor must be met. Secondly, unsustainable consumption of the rich. And here, everything from greenhouse gas emissions, energy, water, and so on, even food, diet, health and lifestyles, all of this can be managed. Uh, at a much better level. In fact, with obesity, uh, and diet, and so on, uh, consumption can be reduced and people can be happier uh, and healthier. This is coming out in study after study of, of many countries, particularly among young people. Now, the important thing here is that this is not a heavy hand of government coming, uh, uh, the consumption police telling you what to do. We are relying very much more on a bottom-up approach. Uh, we are trying to appeal to the affluent who are better educated, uh, better, uh, more influential and so on, what to do through a bottom-up approach. And basically, um, uh, Millennium Consumption goals that are produced are just one building block in trying to build the edifice of sustainable development. It is not the only solution, but it is an important break. We have a Millennium Consumption Goals initiative uh, where many people are working on this and uh, I'll be glad to give you details if you ask. There are mainly the voluntarism, there are cities and communities and businesses who have declared these kinds of goals. They are not waiting for government leaders to tell them what to do. Okay? The city of Bonn uh, or Munich, for example, says by 2030 we will have our carbon dioxide emissions. And in fact, this approach the German government likes because uh, there are the alliance, climate alliance of 2,000 European cities who have endorsed the Millennium Consumption Goals. And what it basically says, sorry, is that if all the cities in a country agree to reduce their consumption patterns, why? Because the mayors and the community leaders are more in touch with their own people than the national leaders. So they can make those kinds of promises. Similarly, for companies, CEOs can commit their company okay, much more strongly and effectively than a government. So this is the kind of approach we are doing. And uh, certainly for sustainable consumption, we use not only the tools of pricing, but also advertising and other means of, uh, of uh, mobilizing social capital. The same, uh, the same advertisement which tweaks you to consume more can be transformed in, to make you consume more sustainably. It's simply that producers don't think that way. Uh, and uh, food spoilage is a major example where one third of the 
the food that is produced is wasted. 50% of food in the U.S. household is wasted. So there is a lot that can be done uh, to, to release some food for the undernourished population of the world. Uh, I'll skip this and simply tell you very quickly something that we launched in Rio called Sustaino Musica, which is called the music of sustainability. The idea, there's a group of musicians, they said, look, professor, you're talking, you're appealing to the mind, you're talking to 0.001% of the world's population. How many people can you change? As music musicians, we can appeal to the heart, we can work with so I think we have to look at different ways of, of getting our, our message across. Uh, and with, uh, let me just skip very quickly here to this, uh, how we work with business and the production side. Uh, in uh, 1962, Milton Friedman, a Nobel Prize winner, said the business of companies to make as much money as possible. Uh, in 19 2009, the CEO of HSBC, the world major bank, said, what are our values? And if you look most recently at Price, Waterhouse and Cooper, they said, sustainability is the top of the business agenda today. So uh, values are changing. Uh, and uh, let me just finish with this thing of sustainable <coughs> production. Just an example of what companies can do with simple. If you look at life cycle analysis of CO2 emissions, if you look at a light bulb that is made in the UK, 95% of CO2 emissions happens at the point of use. So if you teach people how to switch their lights on and off, you can reduce carbon dioxide emissions very sharply. If you look at orange juice that is produced and shipped from Brazil, most of the emissions happen during the transport phase. So there you focus on that hot spot to reduce emissions. If you look at milk production, 76% of emissions happens within the farm. So if you educate the farmers, you put, you're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So depending on how you look at this, whether you look at energy, water, any aspect in the production chain, employment, you can uh, touch on the hot spots. This is value chain analysis and improve the resource efficiency of production. So this is sustainable production. So what you're trying to do is set up uh, sustainable consumers and sustainable producers as a self-sustaining loop and hopefully that spreads throughout society. And I think universities have a major role to play. I think ethical media are extremely important and I was glad that there are some in this room today. Uh, this is the end really. I've, uh, discuss what the challenges are, how we might move forward, which practical tools can be used and who can uh, work now. And I think in the UK and globally we can do uh, a lot. I think I have a mildly hopeful message. The problems are extremely severe, but we know enough to make a start today. We must make a start today. Work, uh, business and civil society working with government and we can build the 21st century global people civilization. This is a quote from Sri Lanka, uh, many hundreds of years old. It says, may the rains come in time, which is environment. May the harvest be bountiful, which is economic. May the people be happy and contented. May the king be righteous, which is social. So many hundreds of years ago, they knew about the sustainable development tracker. We're just trying to reinvent the wheel today. My institute does work on sustainable development. We also give scholarships to students and we welcome interns to come and stay there. I teach this course in a number of universities around the world. These are some of the people. Uh, there are some, there's some reading if you want and I can recommend them to you. Thank you very much indeed.